Welcome into another episode of Everything is Logistics, a podcast for the thinkers in freight. We are proudly presented by SPI Logistics, and I am your host, Blythe Brumleave. We are back with another episode in our NASA series. In case you have missed it, the first one in this episode series has already dropped. It's called Deep Space Logistics. The second episode in the series is called How to Grow Plants in Space. Pretty self-explanatory, I think, for both of those episode titles. So if you're a, a little bit curious about how we as a country, as really a, a civilization, are establishing you know, the, the new infrastructure for the new frontier, or maybe the last frontier is, is what I'm hearing it called, uh, is, you know, either of those two verbiages, I, I, I think will work for the space infrastructure and, and setting up resupply missions and establishing a, a base on the moon. Um, so all of these things are, are taking place in the world of space and the logistics around all of that. And in this episode, we're going to be talking about NOAA. Now, NOAA, N-O-A-A, is short for National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, which is a little bit of a mouthful. So I love the acronym of being uh, being able to use just NOAA th throughout this entire episode because what they do is they are essentially the weather arm of the United States. So uh, for a lot of folks who, who may not be aware of just how weather infrastructure works, I'm going to get into all of that because it is deeply fascinating, much more fascinating than I, I think that I ever realized. I always knew kind of, you know, weather reporting and checking weather reports, you know, typical stuff that we all do. But if, with the goal of, of this particular episode, it, it really boils down to the entire ethos of, of the trip that I recently took. And that, in case you missed the first two episodes, I got invited to a NASA social event, which took place in Cape Canaveral in the state of Florida in late June. And so it was a two-day event. We got to tour all kinds of facilities, get a little behind-the-scenes action of, of what goes into a launch, um, especially a launch that is partnered up with SpaceX. And then SpaceX and NASA are also teaming up with NOAA, which is uh, there. It was responsible for the GOES-U mission. So this was the GOES you satellite mission. And essentially it's to uh, collect data to help the accuracy of weather forecasting that really impacts every single person on earth, including the shipment of your supplies and global supply chains. So I thought this was a perfect episode to, to sort of enter in as number three in our five episode series mix. We've got two more coming after this, which uh, you can check out the website in case you're listening to this, you know, a little bit later on, check out everything is logistics.com uh, in order to see that entire series, because every part of this is incredibly fascinating to me. And I thought from uh, an initial perspective before I went down to, to cover this event and get that behind the scenes insight is that this would just be a, a one episode kind of thing. Like here's, you know, X things that I learned during a, you know, a, a, about a NASA launch, which that episode will be coming. That's the last one in our series. And so with that being said, <laughs> I recorded everything while I was down there for, the, I, I mean, literally everything. I had a real camera, my Canon camera that I use for podcasting. I never take it down off of this setup because it's such a pain in the butt to get it reset back up. But I took it down to this very important event and it was a game changer in helping me capture a lot of different footage um, and recording it all and going through it all. And there were hundreds of files that I had to sort through uh, in order to make this five episode series happen. So if you didn't catch the first two episodes the, for this one, I am going to say that if you were listening to this in the podcast version, you might want to click on the YouTube link in the show notes, because this one is going to have a little bit more visuals that are involved. Not as many. Well, yeah, it's definitely going to be a lot of visuals. So I, and I don't want, I would hate for you to be listening to this and want to see the visuals and then not be able to. So I'm going to do my best to explain whatever is on the screen. So podcast listeners can kind of get, you know, the full experience, but it's not really going to be the full experience. So if you, if you don't uh, particularly uh, like YouTube or like video versions, I would still suggest that, that make an exception for this one because it, it really, the visuals make such an impact into what you're seeing and what can be seen and what can be collected with all of this different sort of, you know, the, the, the flow of data between here on earth 
in space and all of the, you know, the meteorologists and the scientists that are trying to decipher that data in order to help make more accurate weather forecasts, but then also to do the unthinkable and to, uh, and, and measure, you know, like a, there, there's, we're going to get into it. There's a lot of stuff that's really exciting on the satellite. I could just, you know, sort of shoot off of the hip about all of the things that I learned, but I, I made a lot of show notes. And so I'm going to do my best to follow the structure of these show notes. And so in this episode, we're going to be talking about the why behind this goes you mission, what goes into weather forecasting and when we should start hearing the forecast using the data that's collected from this new satellite that has been in production for the last 10 years. And finally, got put on a rocket, shot up into space, and then we should be able to to start, you know, getting that data back. And it's supposed to really, really help amplify weather forecasting and really help change the game in that regard, especially when it comes to the the weather reporting and the weather forecasting here in North America. So all this plus insights directly from some of the smartest people at NOAA, the National Weather Service, and even some pilots who fly the Hurricane Hunter planes. We've got all kinds of footage from that entire tour. We got to actually go to the Hurricane Hunter planes where they were parked at the airport near the, the you know, the NASA sort of complex where if you didn't hear it in the other episodes, it, you, you think of NASA as just having like, you know, a, a few big buildings, a facility on, you know, property grounds in Cape Canaveral, Florida, and, you know, a launch pad. They have 22 launch pads in and around the Cape Canaveral area. And so it is just really impressive to watch the, the, the growth of space, not just from a government standpoint, but also from a commercial standpoint. And when commercial and government kind of come together, like what we're experiencing with this particular uh, instance, where it's a SpaceX rocket that the goes you satellite, which NOAA is a, a government organization. NASA is obviously a government organization. And so they're all coming together in order to, you know, really drive home the, the importance of, of being able to gather accurate data and report on it. So Let's set up a few of uh, really the level setting uh, statements I, I want to make because for the, the flow of, of this episode, we're going to go over some of the press conferences that happened right before the GOES-U satellite. We're going to hear from some of the hurricane hunters that actually fly the planes that go uh, fly over hurricanes. Um, we are also going to hear from pilots. We are going to hear from meteorologists uh, in my group with the NASA social group, there was about 26 or 28 of us. I would say more than half of that group were all meteorologists. So this was like a meteorology, like heavy show. And I, I think for me, just a, a, an initial takeaway, I didn't know how sort of close knit or close ties, I guess I, I should say, that happens with meteorologists that they are uh, it's essentially you're using as much information as you can to make an educated guess and so that's all weather forecasting is is educated guesses based on what you see what you feel what is the, the new twisters movie that that just came out if you can feel it chase it you know that that sort of just like camaraderie among meteorologists, I think is really fascinating. And it's so evident here because, you know, we had our group, which is a lot of sort of like local, regional meteorologists, but then also some more on like the national scientific side of things that are studying national things such as lightning patterns. And then you have sort of the, you know, it's not sort of, you you have the the aerospace meteorologists, which are, are measuring all kinds of things, you know, gravitational pools, solar flares coming off of the sun. So, incredible show. I've spent the first nine minutes talking about how incredible it is. So let's, let's level set. And then we're going to get into the meat of this discussion. So a few level setting things to know the GOES satellites have been launching into space since the seventies. This particular launch was for the GOES U satellite. It will become GOES 19 once it reaches its orbital or orbital pattern. So that is, in case you're wondering what that is, I'll explain it in, in, in just a moment. So these GOES satellites, they typically launch a new one every eight to 10 years. The next one, GEOXO, which is the next in the series of the GOES satellites, is going to be launching around 2032, I believe, if I have my math there right. So as you can imagine, the data and the forecasting get better with each and every satellite that is launched into space. 
So the next one that goes you or the G no geo XO, the satellite that I just mentioned, that one is going to be measuring atmospheric pollution and algae blooms and things like that. Um, so that is a really cool advancement that's already happening because if you're working on one of these missions for eight to 10 years, you have to think that this satellite, you know, it, it's probably not using the latest and greatest sort of measuring instruments and technology, but the GeoXO is using the the modern, and I say modern, today's technology and even some of the technology that's going to be developed in the coming years, it's going to be on that satellite. So um, back to goes you. Once the satellite reaches space, it takes about two weeks for it to enter its geostationary orbit. That's about 20 through 22 thousand miles above the equator then around april of 2025 it will drift into the goes you position and between that and sort of nine month timeline from launch to position scientists call this the checkout period and this is where they're going to be testing and cross testing the data compared to what other satellites that are already in orbit so they're pretty much they're sending the 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 satellite up into space then they have to put it into sort of a the the orbit um, but it's an orbit that doesn't necessarily move around the planet if you're if I'm trying to describe this. It's, it moves with the planet, not around it. And so it, it, I don't really know how to explain it other than that, that phrase, like once it sort of locks on to an area, which this satellite in particular is that it's going to be focused in on the east coast of North America. So they have a, a goes west and then they have a goes east. And so each of those satellites sort of focus in on those areas and then they combine that data to make an entire map of the United States. And even they can see, you know, some parts of like North, uh, uh, North America, including Canada, um, South America, they can even see some of the, the, the things going on in the Atlantic Ocean. As a Floridian, it, it's very interesting to me to know that some of our hurricanes in the past couple of years, it, it, there are moments when it, they, they call it taking the shear off of the top. And what happens is that you have this giant sort of, uh, you have these storms that are for, forming off the western coast of Africa, and they start to form, and then they start to come into the United States, the east coast of the United States, where it, it can turn and go into the Gulf, it can turn and go, you know, up into the Carolinas or even to the the, the northeast. But when some, depending on the wind patterns over in Africa, if they're whipping up the sand from the Sahara Desert enough, then that sand can be whipped up and kind of put on top and and forgive me for any meteorologist who is listening to this. I know I'm not using the proper terminology, but this sand eff effectively mixes in with the moisture that originates for hurricanes. And it sort of just takes the shear, the, the top part of the hurricane off. So it's it's like just it's almost like decapitating a hurricane but with sand. And so they they didn't really even know that this kind of thing existed up until, you know, less than a decade ago. And so these are the newer advancements of things that they are measuring in order to more accurately predict. Because if you more accurately predict these things, then you can give people more warnings. You can have, give them, uh, the governments more time to, emergency responders more time to prepare in advance. Uh, so there's a lot of good things that can come from an increased ability to properly or, or, I guess, correctly, more correctly, be able to forecast a lot of these different weather issues. So another interesting thing is the data collection and the sharing. So the, the whole world, with the exception of China, all share their weather satellite data. I thought that that was really fascinating. And so if you think about all of the data that is being shared between all of these different countries, except China, for whatever reason, they, they don't want to share their data with anybody else in the world. But one country that does share their data is Japan. Japan and U.S. have a very close relationship in this regard. And in fact, there was one of the satellites, there was an image uh, or there was an example given by someone at the National Weather Service. And he said he was talking about an image satellite, an imaging satellite that the U.S. had built and they had plans to build. And so with this mission initiative, with this imaging satellite, they took those plans and they shared them with the country of Japan and their science department. I'm, I don't know what they're not a department, but they're, uh, it's their NASA sort of space arm, a NASA equivalent in Japan. They were able to build 
that imaging satellite up to a year sooner than the U.S. built it. They launched it. But because of sort of the U.S., you know, political situation, uh, you know, it takes a or political red tape, I guess I should say. It took NASA so much longer to be able to build this particular satellite, whereas you have another country that took essentially the same exact plans and built it themselves and launched it into space before NASA ever got the opportunity to build it themselves. They have since built that imaging satellite, but I thought that that was a, an interesting sort of, a, I guess, peeling back some of the layers from weather reporting, space logistics, political stuff. It doesn't just stay here on Earth. It goes it, it, into space as well. And I, I there was another quote, and I haven't mentioned this yet, but um, this quote I thought was was brilliant. They said, money spent on space stays on Earth, and missions like the Goes You helps to save lives and help prevent and prepare for disasters. So, Are you in freight sales with a book of business looking for a new home? Or perhaps you're a freight agent in need of a better partnership. These are the kinds of conversations we're exploring in our podcast interview series called The Freight Agent Trenches, sponsored by SPI Logistics. Now, I can tell you all day that SPI is one of the most successful logistics firms in North America who helps their agents with back office operations, such as admin, finance, IT, and sales, but I would much rather you hear it directly from SPI's freight agents themselves. And what better way to do that than by listening to the experienced freight agents tell their stories behind the how and the why they joined SPI. Hit the freight agent link in our show notes to listen to these conversations. Or if you're ready to make the jump, visit SPI3PL.com. With all of this data being collected, there's also an opportunity in the future for AI and machine learning to play a larger role. Uh, but for Goes You, it's going to monitor the east coast of the United States. It's going to help with fire warnings. Um, it's also going to, it has a corona scope on it that helps to measure the solar flares that are coming off of the sun. To, to put things in perspective back in, and they're going to talk about it in a video that I'm going to play here shortly, but there was a solar flare that came off of the sun Earlier this year, I believe it was in May, and because of the advanced warning that we knew that this solar flare was coming, the satellites were able to turn their direction away from that solar flare, and it ultimately saved the, a lot of satellites in space because they knew it was coming. But just think about if they didn't know it was coming. All of those satellites, they're providing weather information, they're providing GPS information, they're providing national security information. So if those satellites are damaged, then that is a loss of connectivity. It's a loss of information. Um, so a lot of things can happen if we don't have this sort of uh, monitoring in space of, of what the heck is going on. But we also have to factor in all of these different elements that yes, it would impact people on earth, especially when it comes to the energy grid or our internet infrastructure, those kinds of different abilities, but it also affects us from a national security perspective. And so having the GOES-U satellite to be able to help with fire warnings and the Corona scope, that's going to be incredible. And so there's also the overlap of the, the West Coast satellite. It has a higher resolution radar, which will also help with hurricanes and seeing Western Africa. Um, there's also a lightning mapper tool on the goes you, which I didn't know this as a Floridian. I just thought sort of, you know, afternoon storms are just a regular thing, which they are a regular thing. But the lightning in the state of Florida is the most in the United States and possibly North America. I had no idea that we had that many lightning strikes in this state. So if you ever go down to Cape Canaveral and, and, and you drive around, maybe that you get some, you know, some tickets as well to, to sort of see some of the behind the scenes things at, at um, Kennedy, then you will notice a lot of all of the launch pads have a lightning rod at the top. And that's to help prevent some of the electronics and some of the, the machinery uh, from getting struck by lightning. So lightning is a huge issue um, that's really, really important to the launch process. Um, and then also in the state of Florida, so they're dealing with lightning, they're dealing with afternoon thunderstorms. But then from all of the meteorologists, I swear I, my, my weather acumen has increased so much because of this trip. And so one of the meteorologists was also explaining to me that 
So Florida has two different sea breezes that are going on. It's a peninsula. So you have the sea breeze from the west coast or the west side of the state. And then you have the sea breeze on the east coast side of the state. Now, a lot of the state, especially around the Cape Canaveral area and even in the Keys, um, some parts of you know the, the western coast of the uh, Panhandle and also western coast of Florida around Tampa area, there are all of these barrier islands that are off the coast. And so with the, those can also shift the weather patterns. And so for a lot of like the afternoon thunderstorms, I remember I lived at the beaches for forever in, in North Florida before I moved closer to downtown. And anytime I got a weather report, I would ignore it because it was never right. And it was because the weather report was giving a forecast for in the city not the beach, where the beach can have dramatically different weather than it can in land. And that's because over land, the, the weather heats up, the land heats up a lot faster than the water does. So typically when you have those afternoon thunderstorms in the state of Florida, it's because of the storms and forming over land first. And so that's why you have those afternoon thunderstorms appearing over land in the, the inverse at the beaches you'll typically have a lot of thunderstorms that form overnight because it's that it takes a lot longer for the the water to get heated up and and for those storms and those clouds uh, to form. So I, I thought that that was really interesting too and it kind of confirmed my bias of of when I, you know, did live at the beach and I would look at the weather report and I wouldn't trust it. Uh, but now that I'm in town, I'm closer to downtown. We're closer to where, you know, the, the, the Jacksonville Jaguars play football season is starting up soon. So I'm pumped about that. Um, but it's top of mind. But that is why the weather reports were so much more accurate now that I live closer in town versus when I lived at the beach. So a little bit of Florida uh, weather information for folks who are interested out there. So all of this is happening the mission is there to capture more weather-related data in order to help every aspect of our life here on Earth. And so for the, the next part of this, now that I, I've sort of done the level setting of what I knew and what I didn't know and maybe things that you didn't know about you know, weather collection, weather data, and how that process sort of works, in this next video that I'm going to play, you're going to hear from Bill Line. He is a research meteorologist at NOAA. Then you're going to hear from Michelle Smith. She's the communications specialist at NOAA. Kevin Fryer, who is the chief of staff for NOAA's GEO program. Um, and then there's also John uh, Sochik, S-O-K-I-C-H. I think I pronounced that right. He is the National Weather Service Director of Congressional Affairs. So all four of these people are going to be speaking in this next video. And this is sort of, um, it, to sort of give a little bit of background, this was the day one of our two-day tour. So this was the first class that we sort of sat in on, and it was really going over all of the pre-launch, everything that's happened from a pre-launch perspective for this NOAA mission, the goals that they hope to achieve, and and you know just um, a lot of the, the insight and the background of what goes into or what has gone into developing and manufacturing this satellite and then ultimately successfully sending it up into space. So let's play that clip informing on my forecast, but also informing the decision makers that I work with, both in the FAA and then with the emergency managers as well. So for me, having the opportunity to be not only with the GO series, but now the next generation, and I'm not wearing that shirt, but I'm wearing the current shirt, or GOXO, uh, still um, makes me incredibly excited because what we have now is fantastic, as you'll see here in the video, and then what we're expecting to, to be able to develop in the next 10 years is even better. So. For, for me, it's kind of mind blowing. Eventually, you're able to pop the plug. And NOAA is preparing for a milestone satellite launch in 2024. GOES U will be the fourth and final satellite in NOAA's latest generation of geostationary operational environmental satellites called the GOES R series, the nation's most advanced weather observing and environmental monitoring satellite system. Those satellites orbit 22,236 miles above Earth's equator at speeds equal to its rotation. This orbit provides continuous coverage of weather systems as they develop and move across the Western Hemisphere. GOES-U, which will be renamed GOES-19 when it reaches orbit, 
will replace the current GOES-16 satellite in the GOES-East orbit. In this position, those you will continue GOES-East's legacy of keeping watch over the contiguous United States, Central and South America, and the Atlantic Ocean. Like the three other GOES-R series satellites already in orbit, GOES-U will provide near real-time, high-resolution imagery that will deliver critical information for weather forecasts, severe weather prediction, lightning detection, space weather, and tropical cyclones spinning in the Atlantic Basin. It's going to be great when you know we get into the, the orbit of uh, goes east because you'll be able to see, you know, we start seeing the continental the United States, but also uh, out to the Atlantic to the African coast. Because if you think about it, uh, working at the Hurricane Center uh, as I did, you need to be able to see some of the earliest initiation of some of these tropical systems. And like the rest of the GOES-R series satellites, GOES-U will include the Advanced Baseline Imager, or ABI. It is the primary instrument NOAA uses to image Earth's weather, climate, oceans, and the environment from geostationary orbit. Yeah, ABI really rocks. Um, ABI is the primary camera on the GOES-R series, um, and it has a very large focal plane, and what that does for the instrument is it can look at very wide areas of Earth, and so because it can do that, it can scan very, very fast. What that means for the forecasters is they can look at a storm or other area of interest as often as once every 30 seconds. And when you can do it that fast, you know, the forecasters are really seeing that data in real time. Yeah, the early detection is everything, and having the instrumentation, and especially the rapid scan, to be able to have information quickly, uh, because we have something that is such a challenge called rapid intensification, where a, a hurricane, so just a, a band of clouds, become a strong system so quickly, so that the more information and the more data we get, the quicker that we get that information, the better we can do making that forecast and getting that information into the models for a better forecast. So having that rapid information and clarity that we're getting in the new instrumentation, it's just a game changer for the forecasters. And along with the other GOES-R series satellites, GOES-U will have the Geostationary Lightning Mapper, or GLM, the first operational lightning mapper flown in geostationary orbit. GLM identifies the location, frequency, and extent of lightning over the Americas and surrounding waters which can help forecasters understand how thunderstorms and tropical cyclones may be changing in intensity. And since its inclusion as a part of the GOES-R series satellites, GLM has continued to provide new insights. And it could actually distinguish between sort of your average lightning strike and the ones that are more dangerous, the ones that are continuing current, and those are very long lightning strikes that are most likely to cause a fire Having technology in, in the GOES satellite, whether it's GOES-R, GOES-U, and future technology, early detection is everything. And we, we think about a satellite, the first thing you think of is, is a cloud. We see more than clouds, and, and lightning detection is a key to some of our early warnings for the, the fire weather community. So a lightning strike in, in a dry area and a time of the year that can cause a fire, that's an indicator to us that, that there could be a potential fire start. Along with this suite of instruments on board NOAA's other GOES-R series satellites, GOES-U will carry something new when it launches, a critical space weather instrument called the Compact Coronagraph-1, or SeaCore-1. SeaCore-1 will be the third solar instrument on the satellite, and it will image the outer layer of the sun's atmosphere. The Compact Coronagraph is a solar telescope that blocks the disk of the sun, so the, the main ball of the sun, so that we can look at the fainter outer atmosphere of the sun called the corona. And that's where extreme space weather events originate. Being able to monitor the sun's corona helps scientists detect and characterize coronal mass ejections that can spark geomagnetic storms here on Earth. Those are the costliest type of space weather events and can cause widespread damage to power grids, satellites, and communication and navigation systems. So it's very important for us to measure space weather effects and be able to model and provide warnings, forecasts, and alerts uh, for space weather uh, to protect our technological society. Basically, extreme space weather can touch all aspects of our economy and life and property here on Earth. 
I'm extremely excited about the compact chronograph that we're going to fly on the GOES-U satellite. And this is a game changer for our forecast capabilities here at NOAA in the Space Weather Prediction Center. Having that data allows us to more reliably predict when these large solar storms are going to, how they propagate towards Earth and whether or not they're going to uh, affect us here on Earth in a significant way. With Seacourt One and six other high-tech instruments on board, GOES-U will continue NOAA's legacy to help scientists and forecasters understand, monitor, and predict our changing environment from the oceans to outer space. The GO series of satellites supports NOAA's mission to provide secure and timely access to global environmental data and information from satellites and other sources to promote and protect the nation's security, environment, economy, and quality of life. Brokering success demands a battle-ready strategy. Thai TMS equips freight brokers with the ultimate battle station for conquering a tough market. With Thai, brokers gain access to a comprehensive platform where rate intelligence and quote history converge on a single screen. It's not just a page, it's a strategic command center designed to help brokers win. Thai equips your team with all of the data they need to negotiate with confidence and allows them to communicate directly with carriers and customers from a simple control base. Revolutionize the way your brokers perform by giving them a competitive advantage with Thai TMS. For more info, go to tai-software.com backslash battle stations. And we also have a link for you in the show notes to sign up for a demo. So um, first off, like I said earlier, um, uh, my perspective is going to be from the program. I can talk to some of the National Weather Service Development Operation Meteorologists specifically. Uh, and give you some case, uh, use cases for what the satellite really does provide for us in, in the field. Um, but from headquarters and again from research and also from the field, we should be able to answer pretty much any question associated with both the instrumentation on, on the, uh, the spacecraft and the expectations uh, going forward. So this is your time to... I'm gonna, I'm gonna just say just a couple of things about this satellite system. We tend to get benefits from the satellites that we don't even know they're gonna be there. The fire, detection that we can now see in the National Weather Service was something we did not expect when the goals were launched. Our forecasters were seeing the hot spots and were able to notify the firefighters and first responders hours before they would normally be notified of a wildfire. It's, it's amazing what's happened, particularly I know cases in well, all over the West, but it's amazing to see from, from 23,000 miles up, see these hot spots and we alert them and they go put out the fires before they become a big story. And it's amazing to see that, one of, the, one of those things. And my, the first time I, I have to say this as a forecaster, but the first time I saw the imagery from the GOES satellites, the high resolution stuff, was like, oh my gosh, what the heck is that? No idea all the stuff that's going on. You watch the pulsing and the hurricanes and the thunderstorms. It's phenomenal what's going on in there. We're able to see things, the dry air intrusion coming on the hurricanes, seeing it now with all the instrumentation, we didn't see before. It's just amazing. And goes you, well, you're furthering that, it's the same stuff that we've got in the other ones, right. with the addition to the coronagraph. Correct. Remember what happened during, what, May 10th and 11th? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's the story that didn't happen, believe it or not. Yes, GPS was off. All the satellites were able to turn so they'd be safe. The satellites we know about and those we don't. And <laughs> the airlines weren't flying across the poles. So they could defer and not get their passengers radiated. And the power companies were able to make accommodations to their transmissions so they wouldn't overload the circuits and basically cause major blackouts. Preliminary estimates from one of the companies is tens of billions, if not up to trillions of dollars, we saved by the forecast that came out of Space Weather Prediction Center across the globe. We're trying to validate all, those, all the money. But imagine that if you lose the power grid. So anyway, this, this new instrument up there, I point up here, but the new instrument will give us the data from the coronagraph, from the corona mass ejections, 
within, I think, 30 minutes, as opposed to eight hours or more. Tremendous improvement, and we're all excited about it. Okay. Did you want to have a preview? Sure. You saw a lot of imagery on there, but it's not just imagery. These data from these satellites are extremely important in our weather forecast models and making accurate forecasts with those models. We're also now leveraging AI and machine learning to integrate these data with radar and with model data. Forecasters have a ton of data coming at them, so we're trying to come up with ways in which we can crunch that data into products that really are guides for forecasters to help them do their job better. So it's not just imagery, but it's models, AI, it's all of that. We're doing a lot of a lot of great research to really squeeze out as much use from these satellite data as we can. Yes, ma'am. Um, regarding the lightning instrument, um, I'm just curious, if you guys have if it has the ability to distinguish between positive and negative one of the It does. Um, one of the cool things associated with the, and that's the science behind GLM, um, it, it does total lightning. So we're not talking about ground, cloud to ground, we're talking about the total stroke. Okay. And it can also differentiate the stroke as well. So that, there's been a ton of testing between that and the, the tra 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 <laughs> terrestrial lightning network to be able to find out exactly how good it is and as he pointed out, dude, we've got a hell of bad ass system up there. I mean, we're still learning a ton of stuff. And it's not only informing the science of it, but it's also, like he's saying, informing the operators on what techniques can we use to actually say, and how can we better inform the public. So there's a lot of learning that's still going on. Literally before I joined the program six years ago, I had to go through that, I think it was 60 hours or training. training. Yes. So I had to go through 60 hours of 60, like, we're talking class hours of training on top of the shift work that we're doing as well in order to understand what we had. So, uh, again, for me, it's, it's hard to quantify in some respect for, for someone that doesn't sit on shift specifically uh, to understand the level of both information that was available to us um, and then also just the newness of it and how we had to into, incorporate that into our own ability to, to really diagnose the, the, the weather conditions. So, um, again, like I said, the R series has been fantastic. It's been foundational for the expectations of where we're going to go with, with our new capabilities and products and services, um, and we're super excited. And you know, that's one of the reasons why this last launch is a culmination of a lot of really, really good things, and it just allows us to realize, hey, we're we're there, but we but now when we close this off, we still got a little bit, we still got a lot of ways, a lot, a lot to go. She she had a question. Yeah. Yes, in the video you mentioned, um, other than the, the C corp, that there were six other instruments on board. Correct. What I found was so ABI. Um, so we didn't have a breakdown of all of these. That I, that is one thing we'll make sure we do have. Um, <laughs> and I say that only because the most of the other instruments are actually uh, solar uh, instruments as well. Um, X's, size, and I don't want to go through all of them because I'm probably going to end up missing one of them. Magnetometer. Magnetometer. Sumi, um, GLM, GLM, and, and, and maybe I. So, so when we talk about C Corp, and, and the new guy, the new black pool kid on the block, uh, which is C Corp. So most of the instrumentation is actually for solar, um, and for you know for weather specifically. It's kind of all the ABI is kind of the, the main challenge. Uh, I'm curious what Testing. what Three, steps. Two, um, one. Test out. That me? I failed. <laughs> uh, I'm curious, like, what steps um, would be taken if and when the satellite detected, like, a mass coronal ejection that was going to affect uh, the Earth? Because with weather, I could see the obvious steps, you know, like evacuating and other things like that. But I'm curious what we would do or what, you know. You want to talk about how space was yeah. defined? <clears throat> First thing, when you see the mass ejection, have to yeah. determine if it's going to go away from the away from the Earth or toward the Earth. Or glancing low or direct low. Mm. And that's, once you determine that, you put out your solar storm watch. You put out a watch that comes from the Space Weather Prediction Center, mm. Jim and Next Storm. We have categories from one to five. And if we expect it's going to be bad, we'll ratchet, ratchet it up. Like the we only had in May was year five. The first one we've had in two decades of that magnitude. And once we do that, the people and the companies will start taking action to protect it their interests. Like I said, turning the satellites. Yeah. Um, air flights won't, won't go across the poles, right. and the, the uh, electric companies will take the, the, the measures to make sure that they can uh, absorb the current that's created. So when we see it, 
we determine if it's going to get here, then we issue the watch, and then the warnings are coming closer. Amazing. And would that be a longer, uh, you'd have a lot longer to warn the earth than weather, yeah, because weather is so quick? Yeah, you usually have, see, it, it depends on the speed of it. Sometimes it's hours, and sometimes it's days. Mm. But it's not, it's not on the order of, usually not on the order of minutes. Mm. Cool. So you do have some time to take that. Cool. Thanks. Yes, sir. <laughs> so it'll take two weeks to get into a geostationary orbit at that 22 to 23,000 miles above the equator. And then the checkout period lasts, this one's going to be roughly, I think, nine months. And then April, yeah, and then in April it'll drift to the Gozi position. Correct. And in the meantime, the scientists are combing through the data, making sure it looks good, doing validation, calibration. But, uh, we still get to see it. Yeah, absolutely. Which is cool. Yeah. The video alluded to uh, GOES-U turning into GOES-19 once it's in just What is the reason for it? Because it's... to do with the ground system. And it was, yeah. yeah. I mean, they all give a letter. Um, while they're built and when they're launched, and then it, uh, it when it's to the point that it reaches geostationary orbit, then it gets a number. Um, so that's so that the sequence in the ground station is in order in case of a launch failure, which we did have one way back. It was like goes K H goes H didn't reach orbit, so then it didn't get a number. So then the ones that actually did successfully get there, the numbers are sequential. So that's the main reason. So that, so it's confusing because then it's also called go see. Yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's all about data, right? You know, yeah. data strings and, and code. So, and just tell me. Uh, I was wondering how big of a step up the technology on satellite is, like from previous iterations or you know your average. What is how to use that whole like you have five, four, three. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, compared to the so goes R was the first goes R satellite launched in 2016. It has five times as many. Or sorry. Three times as many spectral channels, so we do the atmosphere and channels, so visible and infrared. So it has three times more channels, 16 and 16. It has four times the spatial resolution on average. So our, like, our visible channel went from one kilometer to half kilometer. Our IR channel was one from two to one. And then it has five times, on average, the temporal coverage. But really, temporally, the greatest the coolest thing and the most helpful thing has come from having these movable one minute sectors. So each satellite goes east and goes west, each has two movable 1,000 by 1,000 kilometer sectors where you do one minute imagery. And when they overlap, you get 30 second imagery, which that was, I mean, incredible to be able to see things like fires as they're developing, thunderstorms as they're developing, tropical cyclones rotating. It was amazing to get one minute imagery. Yeah, right. Yeah, I mean, we had, a, we had forecasters tell us this was like going from black and white television it's, it's to a ultra high, to get the ultra high definition. Like, mm. Revolutionary, yeah. those changing. kind of words have been used. Absolute yeah. game changer. It, it was an absolute game changer for someone that's an old head from, from back in the days of King Satellite Imagery. Sure. On, on the pictures, right? Oh, yeah. they, come, they come in about an it's hours after after data time, you get a hard copy picture. So, you get a hard copy picture. Oh, that's, so that's latency is a huge thing too. Yes. With the one minute imagery, you're getting it within a minute of the time stamp. So you're literally seeing things as they're wow. occurring. Yeah. So, 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 sh so short of a radar, basically, we are watching this storm. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. So to follow up to that, like you know, you said you launched the last iteration eight years ago. You know, the next one, you have to another eight years, or does that depend on how you get it? Exactly. You're down on the cadence, absolutely. Yeah. And, and, you know, and hopefully you can tell your congressman that we still need the funding. Um, <laughs> point, point being, this, this, is a, this is a block series, so uh, think of it as, uh, and I'm going to use a lot of, I may mean, end up having to use a lot of uh, uh, kind of comparisons, and I'm an automotive guy. So think of it as a, a particular model year car. You, so these four are a one model year car. The next generation will be another model year. And that's where we're thinking what we have now will be even better. So that's why we're honestly thinking it's going to be the Jetsons. I mean, we're going to be completely, you know, you thought Tesla was hot. Dude, it's going to be something. Really cool. And the time duration between the series is based on the projected longevity of the satellite. Mm -hmm. Making sure the next generation is in place before we, you know, right. before we lose. Yeah, we, 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 we have to have overlap. Yeah. Yes, sir. What's going to happen when the current goes east? It's going to go back up. Storage. Storage to be a backup. So, so it'll stay up there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it'll definitely stay up there. Yeah. 
So I use forecasts a lot with uh, astronomy, uh, and one of the forecasts I use that's, in my experience, the least accurate is the seeing forecast, where you have different atmospheric layers mixing, and it distorts fine details when you're shooting something at very high magnification. I'm curious if this will impact those forecasts at all. I can speak to that a little bit, because I actually have a buddy who's a big sky picture kind of person, and the, uh, yeah, it's just, it's just pictures of the sky. And so, for, in, in my terminology for the military, I think it's called cloud free forecasting, right? So, what areas are going to be cloud free so they can see through it, uh, the atmosphere? And then, more importantly, less wind, turbulence, and point B. And they've done that. And with that question, for us, the imager is not the one that's going to be able to inform that the best. The sounder will be. So, that's the next generation. So our current capability is really, really good, and hopefully techniques will allow you to have better cloud-free forecasting. forecasting. Uh, but the next generation, when we lean on a sounder, will better inform that specific request. Well, bu building on it, it's also, you want to look about the forecast side of things. The more improved data we get yes. into the forecast models, the better the forecast will be for the wind and the mixing and those kind of things. Mm -hmm. So it's all related. And there was one over here. Yes, ma'am. In some of the data I was reading before I came here, I heard that these the, the GOSAR series would be like the foremost predicting satellites until 2036. So with your eight-year time frame that you mentioned until the next launch, is a four-year overlap anticipated, or was that an inaccurate number? No, that's, that is so that we have the overlap. We will be launching the first, well, the plan right now is to launch the first <laughs> U.S. satellite in 2032. Yes. Um, before we absolutely need it. So the, the, the overlap is planned in for that. Yep. Also, who are you? I'm sorry, I know. I was, this, I was like, no, no. I was here earlier. This is Michelle like, Smith, <laughs> our director of communication for the for the GOES program for GEO, for, for GEO, we'll call it, because we are moving away from the GOES, hopefully as of tomorrow, <laughs> um, so we, as a larger program. And the reason I want to introduce her because I think she's absolutely awesome and she's the best thing Thank ever. You. And the reason you guys are here. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yes, so um, in one of the publications I was a part of, we actually studied um, the sun's atmosphere during like um, the so total eclipse of 2017. Mm -hmm. So we're looking at like different wavelengths in the sun's corona. Mm -hmm. Does this? So I'm interested to know like does this particular um, goals mission like you talked about like um, you know space weather prediction and those types of things. Mm -hmm. As far as like the depth of it, does it see infrared? Does it? pick out those wavelengths as well? Or? So, yeah, the gentleman that was on there earlier, uh, Elsai, he talked about the C-core, how it creates this yep. disk, mm -hmm. and creates basically a continuous uh, eclipse to allow for us to understand the science, and that's exactly what you're going to see. And the other instruments on board, SUVI, Exus, and... SICE. SICE, that's the one, SICE. Okay. I always read that one. <laughs> um, they, that's their job as well. Okay. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. Be different. The reason why she's the best, right? No, she's got this computer. <laughs> yes, sir. Are there other chronographs in, in orbit now? There are. There's the, a, if the one that we're relying on, that the Space Weather Prediction Center is relying on now, launched in 1995. And yes. it's only expected to last for two years. Which is um, the reason? Alaska on the Soho mission. Which so, is, like, this, yeah. is, this will be the first operational chronograph because that, that's a re technically research research. Like, but, but yeah, GOES is going to have the first operational. And so if there's any one takeaway, um, what I like to bring out is if you hear research versus operational. Operational means 24 by 7, and there's a, a decent group of people making sure that happens. You have that information, data, and services available. Research means they're somewhere on Saturday and Sunday, and you need to call for service. So when you think about it that way, it's like it's great to have it, but you, eh, you may not get it. you got to wait a few days or so to get another product. Whereas with operational, you're going to get it, and we're going to make sure you have it all the time. And like it. <laughs> 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 These are the wavelengths that our SUV instruments in the Yes. And they all. See, I think in pictures that she knows how to bring them half in the back. <laughs> yes, sir. How long has this uh, goes you satellite instrumentation been in development for? And how do you know when it's done? Well, well, the great thing about it is we had four. So this is the, the fourth one that's been launched. So we have three other iterations of that. 
Um, and honestly, they're kind of copies. Uh, there have been slight, maybe, tweaks uh, for performance, but specifically for performance within the instrumentation, not necessarily on the, we'll call the property service side. So yeah, we're, this, this so is So you of, start building them, and then in sequence, and then, I mean, like the Exus instruments, mm -hmm. they've, I mean, those were all built right away, and they've just been sitting in storage yeah, until they've been, yeah, we're exactly. ready to launch them. Who is so, they? I'm sorry. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, Exus is the um, laboratory, it's last. What's it's last. For? Yeah. <laughs> the laboratory, just, something, space model. physics. Okay. Um, and then, um, so we have different contractors that build the instruments, and then Lockheed Martin built the spacecraft and integrates the instruments with the spacecraft. Did you say last? Test the last. L A S P. Thank you. One. Test. I don't know who that is. Yeah. It's the laboratory it's the for yeah. atmospheric Oh, okay, thank you. It's not atmospheric. Because I was not going to evacuate us, but I <laughs> It does take years to develop the instruments and build in the first time. You get it tested for it and operate it. And that's what, how does it just go out to where it needs to go? Or is there propulsion on the yeah. craft itself? There is. Yeah, absolutely. So we have, and I'm not the engineer guy to give you the for different versions and benefits of li liquid versus the electric. But we do have we do have several different <laughs> we'll call them thruster systems mm -hmm. on board to allow it not only for station keeping but also for maneuvering. Going back to the question about the uh, the previous satellite that's going to be moved to orbit, we'll be using that propulsion system to move it out of the operational orbit into what's called the storage orbit. Wow! Based on on the shelf. Yeah, and then, and then it's like we get to a geostationary transfer orbit, kind of like yeah. that, and like yeah. <laughs> so it takes a few, you know, it, it, it takes kind of pulls it in and it gets into the right final geo orbit. So, so we have controllers at Sulin, Maryland, and uh, our facility, which is one of the best looking facilities anyway, um, big you know one thing across it. They actually fly it. I mean, these are people that fly the satellite. So, you know, you have pilots that you know pilot, and you say, well, we fly the satellite, and they li literally fly the satellite. Yes, sir. Uh, I wanted to ask, like, I don't know if you know off the top of your heads, but how many contractors do you guys have? Or you guys just put together the Lego set? <laughs> <laughs> well, our program is about 330 people, last I counted. Because I had you mean the number of companies or people? Contractors Entities that, you know, do private contract Yeah, yeah. Okay, so we have Paris, who built the main imager, mm -hmm. um, but they also built our ground system, so they processed the data for us, too. We have Lockheed Martin, they built the lightning mapper and the SUVI instrument. We have LASP that built the Exus. We have Assurance Technology Corporation that built SICE. Um, and then Goddard, NASA Goddard actually built the Magneton or Argos T and U. Did I miss any? No. <laughs> We don't know how many contractors work for this company. Yeah, yeah. They have, like, I, I just with, like, yeah, those were our main contractors. Right. But yeah, they all have subs. Yeah, so within within the program, I just know that we have you know basically 330 people that are associated with the program that have hands on touch whatever and understand it. But within that, like they, like they're saying, there's other teams that help develop and build mm -hmm. the implementation or systems. Yes, ma'am. What's the sensitivity of the magnetometer we have more? Oh yeah, it's a great question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, trying to stop the dummy. That's great. Um, you can get back to me later. It's okay. I will do that because I do have that in my notes because it was a it was a thing. The reason why Goddard had that. The reason why Goddard took that mission on for us and, and built because they built a great. I figured it had to be super sensitive if they took it on. That's why I was curious. Yeah, they they yeah, they took it. They took care of it. Oh, look at that. Pictures, and go to our website. Can we, can we you know, tell, them, tell them our website? Oh, please go there. And if you don't find everything you need there, please call me. Because I I believe you will. And we have text messages there. So if you want to build one at home. <laughs> okay, I hope y'all enjoyed that intro press conference clip. There's a lot of really great information in there, um, including Kevin Fryer. I thought that he was fantastic. Um, it, it, just the way that he can explain things and the way that he makes science and weather just really, really, uh, I, I guess, approachable, I thought was great. So hopefully you you liked him and um, I'm hoping to, to get him on the show here in the future. But the next clip that I want to play and you may have heard me talk a little bit about this, but it's called the transporter. I talked about this in the Deep Space Logistics episode where the transporter, there's two of them that are located at, at Kennedy Space Center. And they're responsible for taking 
whatever rocket or satellite from the vehicle assembly lab, the vehicle assembly building, the giant building that they actually store the rockets in. And so the transporter is a, a giant piece of machinery that is so you're, you, you can't really comprehend the scale of these things um, because they're so large. It's, it looks about as big, I would say probably half of a football field, maybe a little bit bigger than that. Um, no, I, I would say about a half of a football field is accurate, but these transporters, their response, they go a little over one mile an hour and they're responsible for transporting the, uh, the, the satellite or the rocket, um, from the vehicle assembly building, the VAB building and to taking it out to the launch pad has its own little custom road and everything. It's a little gravel pit road, which I had my little rock around here that I, I, I borrowed from the, uh, transporter lane, um, that they get to go on. So, um, I just borrowed it in case anyone from NASA is, is listening. It's just a little rock. I'm, I'm sure it's, it's okay. Um, but I'm going to play this clip about transporting a satellite and, um, ask it. So I, I talked about the, the transporter. I, let me back up a second. Talked about the transporter and how they get it from the vehicle assembly building over to uh, the launch pad. But what happens beforehand is that you, th this satellite was manufactured on the West Coast of the United States, I think in California, and they had to ship it from there to Cape Canaveral in order to make this launch happen. So during that press conference, I was able to ask a question about that process and what it looks like and how it functions. And so let's play that clip now. Lockheed Martin CX, whatever, Galaxy. Is there some Galaxy? He does. He's making. Air Force. Um, <laughs> and then they fly to Kennedy, put the shuttle landing facility. Um, and it is excruciatingly slow how, the, how long it takes to load it into the transport and get it out because they are being very careful about <laughs> transporting. Yeah. Does it come out on something like the crawler? Well, eventually it will, so that's it's, what we're talking about. With yeah, the... oh, sorry. Yeah, they, right there, they, they um, bring it out on like a semi truck. Um, but then when they roll it out to the launch pad, there's what I forget what I don't know what SpaceX called it. Because we used to, we used to watch yeah. it's just a ULA. Yeah, okay. Transporter truck. It's okay. not like on the crawler or anything like that. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, you said you're feeling good about the weather for yeah, the... You said it. Uh, no, you said it. Not sheer force of will. That's sheer force of will. We're willing the good weather. <laughs> this is all in our minds intentional. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so everybody would... Be yeah, yeah, we're working on intention, <laughs> will, whatever you want to call it. It's going to be great tomorrow. Now, is it the existing GOES that you're, that's helping aid your will? Mm -hmm. is, yes. is that the, the main... They use the GOES data like in the forecast. It's, 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 it doesn't want to. It wants to stay operational. So it's, <laughs> it's trying to sabotage. We are we are replacing it, so we still with that. It, it has a strong will. It's, 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 it's up there. It's trying to judge. It's it's and when we launch, actually, the um, the Go 16 satellite that's up there, we'll we'll see the you can see in the satellite imagery. Yes. You can see the launch. Yeah. Right. Just rocket yeah. yeah. So so, so follow us on on the the Insta right because I think we're going to make sure. Add we get, satellites. Yeah, we're going to make sure we have that shot because it is kind of cool when. Big brother looks at little brother launch. We've done it twice already, so. And yeah. we do have a one minute sector scheduled to yeah. cover the launch. Yeah. And everything, the hot spot with the launch. Yeah. It's just cool. The job's cool. Oh, yes, ma'am. Well, this is more of a communications question, but I was wondering there were such good interviews with that, and being with news and on social media, is there a way we could, or a person we could talk to to access those to use in uh, footage? Mm -hmm. like, yeah. Sort of sure. I, I can help you. Awesome. Yeah. I'll I have your card because yeah. I met you yesterday. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> if you've got a calm question, please. Awesome. Channels off. So I believe there's a two hour launch window tomorrow. What What's going on? Why the two hour launch window? When they launch the ISS, it tends to be instantaneous. They have to meet up with is it because something to do with the rocket? Is it because of where it's going? You know? Yeah, we don't have to have like the ISS, we don't have to launch at a specific right. time to get into the right orbit. Right. Um, so we get a two hour launch window so that we, you know, if there's a weather delay or anything like that, that we have time, like, that's the window that the FAA gives us because they have to oh. shut down the airspace. So we, it has to be a window. <laughs> um, we can't just decide to do it at any, <laughs> any time. Um, so yeah, but, um, this is a new process. 
for um, for us with SpaceX, and it's different yeah. than like yeah. United yeah. Launch Alliance. Yeah. With once we fuel it, we have to go at the time that it's programmed mm. to launch for its drops. It's not as like we can't. There's not a lot of adjustments once it's fueled. Then it has to go, or it, or we scrub. Or we scrub for launch, and that that's more with SpaceX and or yeah. the physics of the, the actual fueling process uh, and viability. How long is viable? So yeah, so for us, if you didn't understand part of that conversation too, for us within the program, we've launched three already a certain way with another provider. Now we're doing it with, I'll just say, Elon's gang, right? So SpaceX is new for us. There's a lot of change we've had to go through, uh, both from an engineering perspective and just really from a launch operations perspective. And so uh, having this you know, new capability, the new, new ride up there, that's what it is. We, call it a ride. Uh, it's been kind of fantastic to kind of learn all of that because this is the first, but it will not be the last. We will be in this particular rhythm and cadence with the industry going forward. Was the new ride more cost effective? Is that why you yes. switched? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Was there was a competitive oh, procurement process. Yeah. Very, very competitive. Because SpaceX Falcon Heavy has the right requirements to carry such a massive payload mm -hmm. into the correct orbit. Mm -hmm. but, um, and cheaper. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> they call providers. Yes, they are. And they are. They are right providers. I mean, you know, it's like an Uber, you know, who's like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <It's like laughs> <it's like> <laughs> Exactly. Right. Right. But the other part about that truly is that um, that savings is great, not only for obviously the program to be able to, to use other resources uh, for other things, but as a taxpayer. Now you know, yeah. that, hey, the, the industry was disrupted, as you might hear with other things like Uber. Um, and the benefit does come back to us nice. as users and consumers. Nice. So it's proof positive, at least in that case. Yeah. And we're excited. I'm excited to see the booster return because that's a I am too. Yeah. We're getting two for one, basically, yeah. is what it comes down to. This is the first Nova launch right? on a yeah. Falcon Heavy. It's only the second wow. best launch on a Falcon Heavy. Yeah. This is like, this is new stuff for us. Yeah. Exactly. Buy one, get a free booster return. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, you should, you should work in media. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> So hopefully this has been good. Any more questions? Um, yeah, this has been fantastic. My energy's good. I think everyone. I'm just excited to see so many other people excited about the And for those that this is your first, it will be your best. That's what we always say. Right? Yeah. If, if you haven't felt it, it's just an amazing feeling. It really is. Crown from. I like that you said feel, not see, not hear. Feel. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You, 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 you've seen them yeah. take off. Yeah, in all honesty, if you see a close-up movie of the rocket taking off, that's cool. Yeah. But you feel the whole sensation, the visual and the feel. It's just awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, mean, I, I, I know, I, I will never be able to watch this. I'm just going to see that. Four, yeah. five, yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah, it's still going to be great. And then the other part, too, is like we're saying with the return, um, the people that have seen the returns, there's going to be a sonic boom. So who's my Edwards guy? The guy that went to Edwards? Whatever. Yeah, right. So if you remember, you know, certainly out there they had the, the jets coming through and there's a sonic boom. They said, wait for the sonic boom. That's apparently what we have to stand by for. So don't be too surprised. Everybody's like, you're going to be shocked. I'm like, wait, the sonic boom. Just come on. <laughs> 20 years of sonic boom. So they don't startle. But... But just be, be advised, that'll be part of the show, too. And that's free. <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you all the things you get from it. I didn't tell you. you. We hang around after button. launch so you guys can see our experience. And we get a really, you get a good view and you get to, like, feel it when we're at the press site. So awesome. no worries. We'll give you a heads up when it's coming. Yeah, that launch pad, the view from the, is better? We'll, we'll be literally right across yeah. the turn basin. So from we'll be the right old there. launch pad. We'll go mm -hmm. nice. to launch. So, yeah. yeah. Just yeah. Three, three miles away, y'all. Yeah, yeah, I know we got to <laughs> What's the opposite of the Yeah, what's the opposite of No high atmospheric lightning. Yeah. yeah, that's the other thing too with the you know the handle on the overhang. Anyway, um any other questions? If it were to get scrubbed, when would the next date be for launch? Tomorrow. 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 T
Not tomorrow. Not tomorrow. Tomorrow. <laughs> Tomorrow's the one. Like, like, willing and like, I don't even know what day it is. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, Wednesday. The, the, the next day. The next day. Well, well, Wednesday at 5 for the What? Would we be allowed to come back? Yes. Yes. If we scrub Tuesday, you guys will be allowed back for the next attempt. Yeah. Let's go. You, you just have to extend your travel and stuff, but we will have class and all the things you guys can try. So we sure know this Okay, I hope you enjoyed both of those clips. And it, it, if I, if you might be finding yourself wondering, because I, I too wondered, what <laughs> does a satellite look like? Because I honestly had no idea what a satellite looks like. And so I'm going to be sharing a couple of images on the screen. This first one is uh, a full-scale uh, replica of the goes you satellite and it's 125th or not 125th it's 125th scale of what the satellite looks like when it's going to actually be in space and so um if you're just listening i'm sorry to explain this but it's it's kind of like uh gosh how do i explain it it's it's almost like a a giant capsule and then it has a large arm coming out of the side of it and a large, what almost looks like a solar panel. And that might be a, a solar panel, um, but that is, it. oh, it's actually called a solar array. And so let me show you a couple of these videos. So I got uh, one up on the screen right now that it is a the, the 125th scale of the panel and so that I thought was really cool to sort of see because I, I I don't know I, I just maybe I'm just dumb and I just you know I'm, I didn't know what a satellite looked like um, but if you looked at that video and you're like wow what what is a lot of that stuff that is on the satellite excel itself because it does look uh, th there are some heavy instruments that are taking place on this satellite and so I have an image up on the screen right now that talks about the goes you and that big sort of solar panel that is called the solar array it converts energy from the sun into electricity to power the satellite its instruments computers data processors sensors and telecommunications equipment um, but they have all kinds of different here's the the coronagraph that i was talking about and it says the images the outer layer of the sun's atmosphere to detect and characterize coronal mass ejections so translation solar flares that are going to disrupt communications or um you know yeah communications between satellites uh in space and then to here on earth um there's uv uh x-ray detectors uh there's a lightning mapper there's a baseline imager there's an antenna wing assembly which contains a number of communication subsystem antennas for data relay uh then there's also the solar ult ultraviolet imager and it observes and characterizes complex active regions of the sun solar flares and eruptions of solar filaments then there's also the space environment in i, I don't i don't know what to how to even call it it's the acronym is seiss -S -S, space environment in situ suite it, anyways it monitors proton electron and heavy ion fluxes in the magnetosphere so um, geomagnetic, uh, magnetic storms, things like that. Um, which I think is really cool. Cause I, if you watch my logistics of magnets, um, I, I love magnets. So, uh, it's, uh, it, it's definitely an interesting thing to, to get a look at now couple of other links that I thought that y'all would enjoy. I talked about this on the Deep Space Logistics episode, but NOAA is really brilliant with their web presence. And it is really, really intensive of how much information is on this site. And I think if you recall during the intro press conference, um, it, 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 one of the gentlemen towards the end, he mentions that if there's something on this site that you don't see, let him know because he feels it's that extensive of, of what is on this site. And so they talked about, you know, sort of the shipment of the satellite to the Kennedy Space Center. They used an Air Force plane in order to get it there. Um, it, it's very, very sensitive shipments for these devices because if one thing kind of you know one think of like a, a fender bender with this satellite on board or something like that like that is enough to ruin a decade of work 
And, and so obviously NASA and the NOAA team, they don't want that to happen. And so just scrolling through, you know, there's a lot of this process, a lot of this behind the scenes of it being of the, the satellite being manufactured by Lockheed Martin and then being shipped over to Cape Canaveral is just impressive. And so if you're looking at the screen right now, there's there's the satellite, of course, but then it's put into the capsule and the capsule is what goes on top of the rocket. And so you kind of have that capsule sitting on top of a rocket and then on the side of it, especially with the Falcon Heavy rocket, then they have the two boosters that are on each side of the rocket itself. And of course, those those boosters famously are reusable. That was one thing that SpaceX and Elon sort of pioneered is the reusability of rockets and boosters. And those are the rockets that come back down and they land on the uh, different landing pads out in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. And these landing pads are just, uh, they're, they're, sit, they're built on top of a glorified barge. And tugboats and barges are responsible Responsible for you know setting up the positioning right so that those boosters can come back down um, and and land. But that's the capsule that the satellite is in, and then of course it gets loaded onto the rocket itself. You get if you're looking at the screen right now, you can kind of see sort of the, the progression of how that entire process works. But the the website is called nesdis.noaa.gov. And there's so much, and I'll, I'll put a link to it in the show notes in case you want to see some of these images, because they even allow you to download a lot of these images in case you needed to, to use them for some kind of, I don't know, presentation, maybe a school project or something like that. Um, but it is really, really cool uh, to see all of that behind the scenes insight. So we got that done. There's also um, that, that main launch site that I had just mentioned. Um, and then that was essentially the NASA part of the tour later on in the day is when we got to go see some of the ground efforts that act alongside the satellite power and that's other ways of collecting firsthand data to help us better predict the weather and that is the hurricane hunter pilots this was so cool i had no idea that this was going to be part of the the, the tour i figured you know getting the the, the press intro press conference that that first sort of classroom type setting um the video that you saw earlier i thought that that was kind of going to be the extent of it but no they took us out to uh, an airbase and that's where the hurricane hunter plane was set up there was a bunch of executives and scientists and pilots all from noaa that was that were all out there to do you know sort of a lot of these different media things these media interviews um and one of the things that was really really cool is the way that they are capturing that firsthand data and that is essentially dropping these unmanned drones directly into hurricanes like how crazy does that sound that you are going to fly over a hurricane to drop a bunch of drones into it in order to measure whatever is going on inside of a hurricane. It's very, I mentioned twister twisters earlier. It's very, very uh, akin to that style, I guess, is that you have to go in the path of the storm in order to collect the necessary data that's hopefully going to be saving people's lives. Except the, the cool thing is, is that these are unmanned drones um, they are, so I'm going to, let me go ahead and play this video that gives a really good breakdown and a really good explanation of what goes on. It's about a five minute long clip. So again, this is probably best to watch, not listen to it. Uh, but if you are just listening to it, it's basically a, a, the size of like a mailing tube that you would get like a poster in the mail. It's the size of that with a little propeller that's on it. And it has a couple different instruments that they drop it down into the hurricane. And then all of a sudden they're getting the data back on the plane itself. So, so I'm gonna play this clip. Hopper that we can put, um, I, I think about 60 of these into. Uh, and so the operators will prep usually about 30 to 35 for a single mission flight. And this is, what is this thing exactly? It's a GPS drop zone. So this is like a weather balloon, but backwards. And so we'll drop this from the bottom of the aircraft. It's got a parachute that deploys. And then as it floats down, it's collecting temperature, pressure, humidity, wind speed, and wind direction data. There is a radio transmitter inside that sends all of that data back to the aircraft in real time. And then once this splashes in the ocean, sinks to the bottom, makes nice houses for the fish, and all of that data gets sent off to the National Hurricane Center so they can incorporate it into the forecast models. Uh, and so, like I said, we'll typically drop about 30 of these on a single flight. You don't recover them, do you? 
Uh, no, anything that leaves the aircraft is unfortunately expendable. So <laughs> we are not able to get it back. Got it, but you get the data. That's yes, exactly. Wow. So, and so you've now made them this small. Uh, yeah, so the smaller form factor uh, is a little bit cheaper. Um, and our new jet that we're getting next year, which will be a Gulfstream 550, will only be able to launch uh, this project. So. What's this jellyfish? Uh, jellyfish, that's what everybody's been calling it. So this is a uh, Sky Forest Stream song. Uh, so it collects all the same data that the uh, operational Vaisala drop songs get. Uh, but this has a little bit more time aloft. So this can stay in the air about twice as long as these can, because these are a lot lighter than these are. Uh, and and how's so it transmitting data? Uh, radio transmitter. Radio. Uh, so, Inside there? Uh, yep. Oh, so really there's supposed to be an antenna here. It broke off. Got it. Uh, but again, it's the show models. Sure, sure, so, sure. Uh, and these each serve different purposes? Uh, yeah, so the stream songs right now are purely uh, for research. Mm. Uh, and so there's some scientists at uh, NOAA's Atlantic uh, observational Marine Laboratory, I forget, that's not the right acronym, whatever. Anyway, they're there. Uh, it's where the Hurricane Research Division is, mm -hmm. and so the goal is to uh, launch these into hurricanes, see if the data set can uh, supplement or complement uh, the operational the data sets. So you go above the hurricane? Yes, so this aircraft flies above, around, and in front of the hurricanes, and then the other so aircraft... you can see below you a hurricane? Uh, well, we're at 45,000 feet, and a lot of times uh, the cloud tops of a storm will actually reach up to that altitude. So we're not looking down on the hurricane, uh, but we're certainly above and around. Wow. Uh, so the P-3, the other aircraft that we fly, this one flies through the storm, usually between eight to 10,000 feet. So what? Chris is a pilot uh, for that aircraft. Yes. Yeah, that's what we do. So, yeah, there are different aircraft with slightly different mission sets, but they all provide complementary data um, that goes to the models and hopefully makes everything as accurate as a, as we can possibly do. But yeah, like Nick was saying, the G4 there is going to go above and around. Um, and like Jonathan mentioned, try to turn your spaghetti into a noodle. Um, that's ideally what we're going to do there. And the P3 is going to go through the middle and get all of the like the structure and the strength and intensity and just understand what's going on in the middle, like the actual engine of the storm. Um, which they can then provide better forecasts on what the storm is going to, like how strong it's going to be, how it's going to intensify, and of course, understand its life cycle better. Is NOAA the only organization that does that intense sort of getting close and inside storms like that? So we have, um, for hurricane missions, we have a partnership with the Air Force, the Whoa. 53rd uh, Weather Reconnaissance Squadron, um, also flies with us uh, into those storms as well. Wow. Okay, so you got like a buddy up in there with you. <laughs> yeah. Wow. What kind of training do you have to go through? So all of our pilots um, go through, uh, you know, depending on the airframe, they go through a lot of airframe specific training. Um, and then we have a, an extensive syllabus where we do a lot of in-house training that can typically take about two years or so to actually qualify on how to do this. Um, and then on the P3 aircraft specifically, we require at least at a minimum 50 penetrations through storms. Wow. Um, and at least two full hurricane seasons before we would uh, allow anyone to basically take command of the aircraft in that environment uh, without a more senior pilot on board. How many hurricanes have you done? Um, I think over all, I am just shy of 100 total penetrations through storms. This is going to be my third season. Um, flying hurricanes. Nick's flown a good bit more than I have because he's been doing this longer. I flew one of our other aircrafts, um, the Twin Otter aircraft. Uh, neither of these. Prior to that. Ne yeah. Neither of those. Neither of those. So we've got two other kinds of aircraft. We've got a King Air. Uh, we've got three King Air aircraft. Um, for the hurricane mission, we're most likely associated with emergency response after a storm passes. Um, you know, we had one on site when the bridge in Baltimore mm -hmm. fell. Uh, mm -hmm. We did survey and stuff like that as well. So any emergency response style stuff, the King Air will typically be involved in that in addition to the other mission set. Mm -hmm. The Twin Otter can also provide emergency response, but it's a little bit slower, a little bit more designed to handle low level, slow um, types of missions that you may need to use an observer with eyeballs for rather than uh, scientific equipment on board the aircraft. The biggest uh, sort of life property and protection that they do is going to be in the Midwest, in New England, with as far as like snow, um, and determining kind of what those river forecasts are going to be for flooding or drought risk. What's the craziest like, craziest like type of weather that kind of like scares you when you're in? So I hope you enjoyed that that clip from the pilots that are the actual Hurricane Hunter pilots and. 
a couple of things that I, I I wanted to pull on on the, these different strings is that these pilots are flying through some of the worst weather uh, of all time. In fact, there was one of the questions that was asked, and it, it wasn't you know th this audio from from these different talks is is suitable to use somewhat um, because the information is that good, and we have a really good podcast editor who who can clean it up very well. Um, but the, uh, there was some audio that I could not use that just simply it you know people were talking way too loud in the background in order to make use of it. But there was one really good question that was asked, and it's what was the worst weather that you had ever flown through? And one of them said that Hurricane Ian was the scariest storms that these pilots had ever been through. That happened in late September 2022. That was a Category 5 storm that hit Southwest Florida. Uh, the pilot did show us a clip from inside the plane. And you could kind of see, uh, you know, a little bit of the, you could see the plane jumping, of course, not jumping, but, it, it, you know, in turbulence, you know, anytime you're you're flying commercially and you experience turbulence. Uh, but this was just, it was much more extreme because obviously they're flying through a hurricane. There was also a lot of lightning that you could see just out the, the window of the plane itself. And so it was a little crazy to uh, imagine going through that experience because it was crazy watching the video of it. So I can't imagine being the pilot in that situation and having the calmness and the wherewithal in order to, to, to get through something like that in order to gather that really, really important data. Um, so in this next clip that I want to play, and this is us actually getting to go inside of the plane itself. And so let me pull up that clip. Because there are a couple of them that that I want to show, and it's because when you're on the plane itself, you have a bunch of you have, obviously you have the pilots, you have a couple different scientists, um, and then you have the people that are on the flight to drop the drones. They have a shoot that is on the plane that is dropping these drones, these unmanned drones in that goes inside of the hurricane. So let me go ahead and pull up this clip. You know, as technology improves and things get smaller, <laughs> so um, we used to have like more of a Pringles can size, and now we're down to like a paper towel roll <laughs> size mini sons. But the chute is actually in the back behind uh, the farthest left seat there. And so that chute that she's talking about, I'm going to play it in this next clip. It looks like a, if you've ever worked at a bank, you remember like the old school like shoots? I, I don't know if, in, I haven't been inside of a bank in forever, but you know how they were would count money and they would put it inside the little tubes and then the tube would go inside the, the vault. Um, this is essentially kind of the same technology that they're using these drones to drop them in another chute. So, so let me go ahead and play this minute long clip. Just all the, the oh, that's where it here. is. Cool. Yep, that's it. So we'll have our two engineers here. This one will actually see real time as the droplets on is going down the chute or down down uh, to the water. How uh, all the data is collecting, if it's correct, and um, you know, make sure that this didn't like you know start flopping or that it's not a fastball and going too fast. Oh wow! So um, okay. And they'll coordinate with the flight directors up in the furthest two seats, so not the pilots, but the furthest two up here in the uh, main cabin. Those are our meteorologists, and they talk to each other the whole time. Like, wow. okay, yep, this one's looking good. Okay, we'll package it up and we'll send it down to um, the hurricane center. Talk to aircraft operations center if we have any issues. We also have in-flight tech support, so they'll sit between these two seats. And this is where they can do some control deletes and all sorts of technical, you know, troubleshooting uh, for us. So, in theory, we wouldn't, we shouldn't have to abort for any mission-related yeah. issues. Now, speaking of the pilots, that there was a, a little bit of a other, you know, just a, a lot of like FAQs, a lot of frequently asked questions, or maybe I, I don't, I'm not sure if they're frequently asked questions, but there were questions that our group had. And so I thought that this next part uh, with the pilot, the Hurricane Hunter pilots d answering some of those questions, it's about a uh, two and a half minute long clip. So I'm going to go ahead and play this one now. And through an actual hurricane, we're going to have at least two pilots at the controls. Yeah. Um, and their main job is to work in tandem with the flight engineer who's maintaining the engines and the systems of the, of the aircraft to keep it within a very tight uh, profile. Um, so we have a very tight speed band we're operating in that's safe um, and effective for getting us into and out of those uh, high turbulence areas. And then we want to keep the aircraft on a very specific track um, that allows us to go through the worst that these eye walls have to offer without putting ourselves into excessive amounts of danger. And our in-flight meteorologist is giving us those tracks and really working the radar to help us get the plane through 
the softest part of these eye walls. Um, but so the pilots are maintaining that track and also trying to maintain the aircraft as level as we possibly can. Of course, during these um, these storms, we could be getting really massive updrafts and downdrafts, and we're trying to fight thousand plus foot per minute um, vertical changes, uh, all while trying to maintain right at about the eight to ten thousand feet typically that we're trying to go through these storms. Um, so it's a lot of you know it's very much a coordinated dance where everybody has to be communicating really quickly, really well, um, so that we can maintain everything as safe as we can, so we can get through these storms, get the data, and get everybody home. Wow. Has, any, has anybody, and this may be a dumb question, has anybody ever been like struck by lightning, like the flight itself? So the aircraft does get struck by lightning. Um, that's not a terribly uncommon thing to happen right. in, in these environments. We try to avoid lightning for that reason, um, because lightning strikes, even though they leave basically just a little pinhole in the aircraft typically, um, that can cause uh, pretty catastrophic damage if it hits the wrong spot. So we do, uh, anytime we fly around lightning, we do a much more thorough inspection. Uh, to make sure that the aircraft remains in a flyable condition um, and we can min minimize any sort of damage that occurs. Yeah. Um, how does one decide to be in this profession? <laughs> uh, so there's a lot of different ways that you can get involved with being a hurricane hunter. Uh, so Chris is a pilot. Uh, we have pilots, we have navigators, we have flight directors who are meteorologists uh, by training. I'm an aerospace engineer. Uh, we have electrical engineers, computer engineers, we have aircraft mechanics. Uh, there's all of these folks, uh, they're scientists at the Hurricane Research Division. There's all these folks that have to work together on the aircraft to make sure that we are safely collecting the data that we need to and that we're effectively doing it. Uh, so there's a lot of different ways you can go about it. As far as wanting to, uh, I didn't know this job existed before I applied for it, uh, but now eight years in, it's hard to imagine doing much of anything else. Uh, it's exciting. Uh, you get to work with some incredibly smart and talented people. Uh, you get to go to some interesting places. Uh, it's fantastic. It's, it's, uh, is it the end of the so we'll end that clip right there. And, and and you might have heard them talk about, you know, two different planes that uh, that the hurricane hunters are, are piloting. One, you can actually see in the background that that's the plane that they have been historically using. But the coming soon, very soon, I, I believe this fall is when these hurricane hunter pilots are going to be using the new plane called the P3. And be, with the new plane, they have that new design for the drones. And so in this next clip, I'm going to be showing you the uh, the, the drone with like the little propeller that is on uh, the, the, the tube itself, the bank tube is probably what I'm going to call it just for the podcast listeners out there who are trying to visualize what this thing actually looks like. It looks like, uh, I, I will say it looks like a, a, like a paper towel tube with obviously some very fancy instruments going on inside of it, but they also have a propeller on it as well to help with gliding and, and, and data collection. So let me go ahead and play this next clip. Uh, like I said before, we do not deploy these from the Gulf Stream 4. We'll launch these from the P3s. Uh, so this is a small, uncrewed aerial system uh, that is able to get to parts of the storm that are otherwise too dangerous for us to fly. And so the P3 will never go below 5,000 feet in a hurricane environment. These can fly as low as 30 feet above the water, collecting all kinds of high-resolution data that we otherwise wouldn't be able to get. Um, and so we'll launch this out at the bottom of the aircraft. This wing folds back Whoa, and then sick. deploys. Uh, it has a wind sensor. It's got the communications antenna. We can uh, stay in communications with this out to at least 125 nautical miles. That's what we tested to in March. Uh, it has a pressure, temperature, and humidity sensor, much like the drop sons do, and it's got a laser altimeter, uh, so it can measure wave heights as well. And so this has a endurance of about 90 minutes, and so typically we'll fly into the center of the storm, launch this, and then it will typically fly a preset pattern, but we do have an operator on board who can issue new commands to it. Uh, if they see like an interesting part of the storm that they want to go sample more, they can steer it that way. Uh, and the goal with this, like I said, is to get that high resolution data in uh, what we call the boundary layer. So that's where the ocean and the atmosphere are interacting. Uh, that's where all of that energy transfer is taking place. And getting high resolution data there has a potential to uh, give us a greater understanding of how hurricanes intensify. Uh, and so right now, this is purely a research platform. So none of the data that this is collecting is going into the forecast models. Uh, but 
hopefully, uh, given time and given uh, its value proven, this data could find its way into operation forecast models. How many of them are typically used at one time? Uh, we can never have more than one in the air at a time. Uh, we have the capability to launch multiple over the course of a mission. It's usually about eight hours in length, only a 90 minute lifespan, so you can fit a couple in there. Uh, but our rules dictate we won't have more than one in the air at a time. That's for safety of our aircraft, as well as safety for our partner aircraft if the Air Force is out there. Um, Deconfliction for us is very important. Nobody wants to run into each other. Uh, we have for this season, 18 of these ready to go. All right, that's the end of that clip. And then I got one more for you that it, it's it kind of similar, but it's a good breakdown of each of the drone pieces and then how many they drop and what happens to them after the drones are dropped. So let me go ahead and play this one. These black swoops, they're out in Colorado. Uh, they make these. Um, I'm not sure of their processes though, mm. but carbon fiber wing, uh, carbon fiber rod that runs uh, the length of the fuselage here. That's what keeps it from snapping uh, once it gets into those hurricane force winds. Um, and then the only control surface is back here. Uh, it's called an elevon. Uh, and so this will move and steer the aircraft. And then Looks like a, a drone. It is a drone. Like a yeah. Yeah. drone. Yeah, yeah. Wow. You said it's disposable, so it's like the others where it'll just Anything fly the that once? leaves the aircraft is expendable. Mm. So not able to get them back. Um, but just like with uh, the drop signs, the value of the data is immense mm. uh, because there's really no other way to get it. Really, really good clips from those Hurricane Hunter pilots. And keep, keep in mind, this was all day one of our tour. So, you know, as we sort of round out day one, let's get into day two, which is actually launch day. So this is the day that the satellite is going up into space tentatively. Day two becomes more about watching the weather, especially in the state of Florida. I don't have to tell anyone who has visited the state that we get afternoon thunderstorms every single day over the summertime. So launches taking place in like June, July, and August, I'm like, hmm, the success rate can't be uh, all that great, except it it does. It, it happens uh, pretty regularly. And uh, I would say one of the more, I guess, shocking, not shocking, but more of a, a realistic thing is that while we were there, I, I said earlier that we were on this tour with all kinds of regional and national scientists, meteorologists, you know, these are the pros of the pros. Also with all of the NASA meteorologists and 90 minutes before the launch was supposed to take place, none of them had an idea on if the launch was actually going to happen. 90 minutes before launch. You have some of the smartest minds in the world when it comes to weather, all congregating in one area, all really hoping that the launch would take place. I mean, spoiler alert, it did take place. But 90 minutes before the launch, we really didn't know if we were going to be able to see the launch that day. Now, if it didn't happen, then what NASA was, you know, had the, of course, NASA has contingency plans. So they were going to invite us to stay an additional day in hopes that the launch would take place on Wednesday instead of that Tuesday of that week, which would have been really unfortunate because a lot of folks traveled in from all over the United States just to come to this tour. I was lucky enough that I drove in from Jacksonville. So it was only a two hour drive for me. It would have been very simple um, in order to extend my trip another day. I didn't really want to, because I was anxious to, you know, kind of get back to the normal swing of things. Plus by this time you're, you're just, you're, you're ready for the launch to happen. Like spent, you know, two days, you know, with this build up process, I can, and, and I cannot imagine the people that spent eight to 10 years on this project and are anticipating, you know, 90 minutes before the launch is a go or not. Uh, it, it was still very, very much in the air. Um, I'm actually going to play a clip for y'all here um, in a minute of what goes on with the uh, Space Forces launch weather officer. I love that name. I, you know, I hated it at first. I thought it was a little just like, oh, that is so cringy. Space Force. They have a fantastic logo. Um, and just saying it now, it just sounds really, really cool. But this guy, so we, uh, the the Space Force's launch weather officer. So this is, to, to paint the scene for you, it is 90 minutes before the scheduled launch. We've done all of the tours. It's been 
two and a half days of really fun educational, uh, but also it's a lot. Um, you know, so it, you're all you're all out in the heat too. Florida summertime heat. It's I'm a Floridian. I know how it is, and so even I was you know pretty tired at this point. Really hoping that this launch was going to take place because I didn't want to go through another day of of you know, wondering if it's going to take place or not. And so for this next clip, I'm going to talk, I'm going to be showing uh, the Space Force's launch weather officer who was responsible for coming into the room at this point. So we're all in like the press media center area. That's right by, it's it's three miles from the launch pad. So this is where we are going to be watching the launch take place. It's where the giant countdown clock is. If you've ever watched any of these launches on television, it's three miles. So it's as close as you're going to get for a, a space launch is three miles out. And uh, it, so we're by the countdown clock. We go inside um, in order to get our final briefing and just kind of wait out the next 90 minutes. And the Space Force launch weather officer comes in and he's sort of explaining his role, how he got to this role. Um, and then also there, there was such an interesting moment because it was, he came in and during his conversation, he, he said it like it was nothing. And he mentioned that the launch wasn't going to happen. He dropped a bomb on us essentially um, after these two and a half days, 90 minutes before launch, you know, you have all these, all these amazing like photographers there with our group too, that were just, I mean, he dropped this bomb on us. 90 minutes before the launch. We had no idea if the launch was actually going to happen. So that is setting the scene. And so let's go ahead and play this clip. First off, how many people are from this area? A lot of you. How many people are from out west? Okay. So I lived in California for a while. Uh, obviously a lot more humid here than anywhere in California ever. Uh, but this is very typical weather for this time of year here. So getting the thunderstorm clouds uh, along with our sea breeze, that's very, very normal. And of course, this you'll get thunderstorms oftentimes with it. Of course, uh, if we look at statistics, this is about the worst time of the day and the worst time of the year to launch. <laughs> <laughs> uh, great. Obviously, they didn't listen to the weather people when they made that plan, but no, honestly, it has to do more with where in the orbital insertion process we need the satellite to go. So we don't really have much of a say with that. But for a lot of missions, um, we'll be involved in still helping the customer select a P0. So there's been a lot of the space link launches um, from SpaceX, you know, Starlink. Um, those are four hour launch windows. So they give us a lot of time to play with in that time. So we we'll usually start off with a forecast saying what we, our expectations are for the probability of a, a no go during that count. Uh, and then if we see a change in that four hours, uh, a, lot, a lot of times it's an evening launch. Weather will get progressively better as the window progresses towards midnight. Then we'll see a, a drop in that so-called probability of violation of fuel. Duty. So a lot of times we help select the T0 for the test. So we're doing that. My colleagues are doing that. Brian Sizek, he's another launch weather officer. He is the main one here today. So he's back uh, in our shop with the console and talking to SpaceX. Uh, also uh, talking uh, with uh, NOAA and NASA. So the satellite is kind of their baby as well. Uh, just trying to select the best T-0. We are no-go right now um, from a weather uh, standpoint. Again, those clouds that you see, there, they don't look that menacing. The problem is that they were torn off with thunderstorm clouds, and so they carry a electrification with them. Depending on the exact nature of the cloud and its temperature level, they could be a problem for up to four hours after the time they actually get ripped off of a thunderstorm. So the thunderstorm could be long gone. Under certain circumstances, the clouds that are left behind could still be sufficiently electrified that we could not pass through the cloud itself. Now, if the vehicle passes just a couple of miles away from the cloud, that actually we work under a little bit less conservative rules. Um, again, depending on the, the temperature structure of the cloud, so we send up weather balloons to get that information. We use weather radar, and we have a, our own weather radar, uh, distinct from the National Weather Service, that helps us interrogate uh, what the clouds actually are doing out there in the temperature and thickness of those clouds. So. Nobody's happy about it. Oh, so. <laughs> I love 
the silence at the end of that video because it was deafening in that room. And I, you know, hopefully, you know, me setting the scene earlier is kind of uh, I- I- indicative of of what just happened. That that wasn't just a, a normal like podcast pause. It was the silence of the ending of that question or the ending of his statement. And the rest of the room is just stunned because he says the words no go. But then just a few minutes later, he was able to sort of, I guess, um, correct the ship a little bit with his verbiage because I think he kind of felt it in the room that everybody was just crushed. And then he goes on to, you know, sort of explain a little bit more. And it was uh, that that he's forecasting the two hour launch window, not just the exact launch time. Um, And so let's let's go ahead and, and, and play this next part. Launch weather officer's job can be like over a huge amount of campaign and from a weather perspective, it was just forecasting the hurricanes, but like days like today are always tough because you move in and out of weather violations and they'll keep you on your toes. Mm-hmm. With it being in and out of weather violations, saying no go, is that for the expected uh, zero time or is it through the entire window? It's for the current time and then the, the launch oh. weather officer will also try to time out an estimated clear oh, time. Not. So we <laughs> might see a no go. We have two hours to play with today, so hopefully we'll get some go time So for, for, sorry, for like a wind, yeah. like their area of wind, yeah. the, mm-hmm. how much spatial would we need? So the, the answer to that is, is it depends. So this is a two-hour launch window. For this particular launch, we gave him a 50% chance of violation at the beginning of the window, 70% at the end. So weather overall should get a little worse because we're getting the, the tops of those thunderstorms to the west blowing off over us. So, you know, again, it, today is not exactly working out as we had expected. Like we thought the development of the initial storms would be a little farther to the west. So the front end of the window is a little worse. And uh, the 50% probability of violation, we, there's a, an old saying that you shouldn't use 50 because it's like flipping a coin. Mm-hmm. But it is a real number. And we're saying a one in two chance of, of actually having a weather violation, which actually is happening right now. But again, we're forecasting for the window, not just the count, which extends two hours in advance of that. Gotcha. Now, ultimately, that 50-50 chance that he speaks about ended up going in our favor, thankfully. And so uh, pretty much like right after this gentleman left, I think we were in the room for about 10 more minutes before our guides came back in and they said, okay, well, first they they gave us um, a little bit of a heads up where they said, okay, if things go wrong during the launch, which they have to, NASA has contingency plans, as I had already mentioned. Um, so if things go wrong, Drop out, drop all of your stuff, and follow us. Uh, that was essentially their rule. If, if something goes wrong during the launch, we were to drop your cameras, drop all of your expensive equipment, and just run towards whoever the your nearest guide is and follow them because they will know where to go. So I thought that, that was a little um, interesting and kind of reassuring at the same time that there was a backup plan in case something goes wrong. Luckily, nothing did go wrong. Um, so we went right outside, and w- it was one of the coolest things you will ever see in your life, and that is a NASA launch. And I, I, I can't really describe it, but in one of the videos that you can hear, it is just so incredible to feel the heat and the light off of the the, the launch itself. It kind of felt at times that maybe we should have like safety glasses on um, or something like that because the heat and the light were so bright. It was intense. It was already hot as balls outside in Florida summertime in late June. Uh, So to add on the additional heat factor of the shuttle launch was incredible. And then the boosters coming back in and the loud like sonic boom that they make when they come back into the atmosphere. I mean, it really is just incredible. So I can't really do it justice when I'm explaining it. So I think what would be best here is to uh, play a tweet from that launch itself. And so let me go ahead and pull that up. Nine, eight. Seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Go, go, you. Liftoff of Goes You, NOAA's newest weather satellite to monitor the Earth and Sun in high definition. So cool. So cool. 
I still like can't get over it. I'm smiling like ear to ear in case um, you're, you're not able to, if, if you're listening on the podcast format, like I said, go watch the video version of it so you can get the full grasp of everything that I am talking about here. Um, and then, you know, as it, you, you kind of learn more about this, you know, there, I did wonder like, well, what the heck, it, like, where, where's the goes you satellite now? We, we saw it in, you know, it was, it, it's one of those things. So let me pull up a tweet of uh, the, the goes you satellite arriving to space and then going in, setting off into orbit. Um, I'll link, I'll link to this tweet in the show notes in case you want to check it out, but it's just, I mean, it's incredible here. It is detaching from the capsule itself. And so this satellite will actually drop off. And it says in a follow-up tweet that goes, you will get into geostationary orbit. A satellite in this type of orbit doesn't move relative to the ground. It will always be over the same place on the Earth's surface. That's valuable for weather monitoring because the satellite will then have a constant view of the same surface area. Gozu is expected to operate for over 10 years. So that is a just a, a cute little moment where you can kind of see the satellite going off into its geostationary orbit. And uh, yeah, so it's it's just overall an incredible, incredible experience. I cannot say that enough. If you've never watched a shuttle launch, if you've never been a part of one of these launches, I highly, highly advise, you know, whether you're in, in, in California or Texas or can, can make it over to Florida. I know Florida in particular, I've mentioned in, in the other episodes in this series that, you know, I, I thought there was like two or three launches a year. Now, because of the growth of this industry, there are two or three launches a week. So if you come to Orlando area, you can take a, a drive east of Orlando, rent a car, um, or even if you're in the area, the southeastern area, you can drive down to Cape Canaveral, stay for a few days in the area, and you're bound to see a launch. In fact, the, the first day that I arrived before the tour officially started, uh, me and my fiance went to the beach in the area, the, the Cape Canaveral National Shoreline, which is a beautiful beach in case you want to go to it. Um, but we arrived there and a launch was taking place like five minutes afterwards. So we, we got to to see essentially two launches in in one uh three-day trip so in, in, incredible and so um i do want to play one more last clip because it's just it's it's from lockheed martin and it's just cool to see just sort of the entire mission uh come together into one video so it's about a minute long for this video let me pull this one up and it just recaps the entire like manufacturing process the shipping process and then ultimately sending the satellite into space so let's play it <laughs> Really great video that they put together, and I just realized that I have been telling you guys that this uh, that this uh, satellite was manufactured in California. It was not. It said it in the video that it was actually met, uh, manufactured in Colorado. So uh, yeah, really great video. Really great social initiatives too for uh, the NASA Kennedy Center. NOAA and Lockheed Martin to kind of all come together with their media expertise as well in order to put these things together up really quite frequently because I want to say that that one video that we just launched or that we just watched was the Gosh, it looks like ten minutes after where the, after the fact. Um, just doing some some quick little uh, uh, Google searches right after. So. That about does it for this episode. I, I really hope that y'all enjoyed it as much as I enjoyed creating this episode. I know it's a little bit of a longer one, uh, especially with, with all of the extra clips that we added into this episode. But I just think it really rings true and really rings home. You know, how I would say not as not as advanced. How, how can I say this? It really rings true about 
how short of a time span that we have been able to collect data on weather activities here on this planet. And reporting on it, what we see, what we can feel, what we can measure, it's really only been going on for a few decades. And you think about the entire, you know, not just the entire history of, you know, the universe or even Earth to an extent with billions of years of, of weather data that we don't have access to. But these are just small incremental steps into better data collection that starts with better logistics here on Earth that ends with space logistics, that ends with data communications from space down to earth in order to help all of these scientists who and meteorologists who are trying to do their job and to make the world a, a you know, a, not necessarily, they can't really, they don't have the power to make the world a better place, but they can, they do have the power to provide you with the information to get out of dangerous situations sooner rather than later and to help emergency services prepare for those different weather events that are going to happen no matter what. And so this was a really, really fun episode to put together because we all know how much weather impacts us here on earth, not just from a leisurely standpoint, but also from a commercial standpoint. Shipping and logistics, the constant foe is dealing with weather issues, whether it's flooding, whether it's hurricanes, whether it's uh, wind and rain, all of those different fires, you know, all of these different weather extremities that are going on across the globe. We need more data in order to be able to, to and have smart people decipher that data in order to help create, you know, a, a better living environment for the realities that are here on Earth. Now, this is, again, a five-part series, so I will link in the show notes to the other two episodes that have been previously released. Be on the lookout for the final two episodes in this series and then ongoing space logistics episodes that we will be having here on the show. So hope y'all enjoyed this special edition and uh, uh, thank you for tuning in and uh, I'll see you real soon.